Come away, O oh human child, to the waters and the wild, with a fairy, hand in hand, for the world's more full of weeping than you can understand. Song of the Sea is a 2014 film written by Will Collins and Tom Moore and is directed by the latter. It received a lot of critical praise, including an Academy nomination, but was passed over for Big Hero 6. Part of the reason, I believe, is because here in the United States, there wasn't much attention given to it. It only played in select cinemas and advertisements were sparse, which I think is criminal because I love this movie. So, what is it about? Well, at its simplest, a brother-sister human silky tag team trying to get back home to avoid catastrophe. At its most complex... A Celtic mytho amplification of grief's manifestations and ramifications in a familial unit with emphasis placed on the developing behavior of an adolescent mind. Kip, old friend. Let's wrap. The movie starts with a tragedy and a birth. It then cuts to six years later where we see the main character Ben with his little sister Sersha playing by the sea. Ben is revealed to resent Sersha and shows us by denying her their mother's stories and conch. But considering it's Sersha's birthday and Ben's being a bit of a dick, Sersha, like any good little sister, takes the conch anyway and plays it, where she discovers its magic and her own. That is, she's a selkie. Which is like a mermaid, only not really, since selkies can go from seals to humans at will by shedding their coat. Traditionally, this usually leads to some shenanigans when a human discovers the coat and hides it to make the selkie their sexual slave. Only, this is a kid's film and that part of the mythology has been eschewed, thank god, in favor of showing us this really cool sequence where Sersha frolics underwater. Sadly, Moonlight Swims aren't exactly smiled upon by the kids visiting Granny, who emotionally manipulates her still grieving son into giving up his children. Neither kid is happy about this, but since Ben can actually talk, he's more demonstrative about it, especially since leaving means abandoning his dog, Koo. Stubborn boy. But like all Homeward Bound movies, it happens anyway, and off they go towards Dublin, where the closer they get, the more we the audience realize it's Halloween, or Samhain. And for those of you who don't know, Samhain is a liminal time in the Celtic calendar where the veil between this world and the next thins, allowing fairy folk to rub elbows and raise hob with the humans. Which is worth mentioning because when Saoirse plays the conch, the gathering lights garners the attention of the resident good folk, who kidnap her, and by proxy her brother, to inform her of the Silky's responsibility to the Dina Shi, or People of the Mound. This all comes as a surprise to Ben, but since it lines up with his plan to return home, he decides to help the fairies by helping Saoirse find her missing coat for which they get attacked by a bunch of owls controlled by a nefarious being called Maka. But Saoirse is able to fend them off and the movie gets a quest. As time passes, however, Saoirse grows increasingly weaker until the owl witch is able to carry her off. While trying to get his sister back, Ben meets the great Shauna Key, whose character design is based off of the real Shauna Key named Eddie Lennon. Anybody who'll tell you that these things don't exist doesn't know what he's talking about. And for every hair he has, there's a memory or story to go with it. And those that are still growing are the ones that are still going, which means he knows Saoirse is alive and gives Ben a hair that will lead him to Maka. Ben follows the hair through a stream of consciousness into the root of his resentment, which is the day his mother vanished. Rona? Mom? From which he realizes that Saoirse was not responsible for their mother's departure, but he is for his actions against her. And I would argue that withholding affection is an action. Ben made a choice. No matter how young and understandable it may have been, he still carried out with the intent to hurt. Maybe not physically, but emotionally. He blamed a baby for his mother's absence, and judging by his reaction here, he knows what he did was wrong. This is a beautiful catharsis. By confronting the problems of his past, Ben is able to rise above it, literally, to help save his sister. And this is where the story goes from good to great. While it's been hinted at before, this scene in particular confirms that the myths are exaggerated mirrors for the adults. Just look at the interior of the Krenog. Shot for shot, it's the same setup as their granny's house. Even the song on the radio is the same, which is how Maka seems at first blush, like a kind old lady. But by filling the home with visual reminders of her ethnic cleansing, it really adds to that economy that was established in the previous shot. A storm outside, but calm inside. Warm even, if not welcoming. So to see the jars strewn about is very off-putting, especially when Ben steps into Maka's shadow expecting threats but is greeted by a very soft-spoken and kind creature. Don't take me for a fool. Until she's not. But credit where credit is due, Maka came close to turning Ben into stone without ever having to trick him, which shows you just how consuming grief can be. That is, all these characters are coping with grief in various ways. Ben through his anger, Connor by shutting down, and Granny in becoming a well-intentioned but ultimately toxic busybody, all of which are unhealthy and manifest themselves into Saoirse, who never knew her mother except by the emotional fallout her absence has inflicted. 
Yet, none of this is blatantly explained in the dialogue, but can be inferred from the characters' interactions, making it a prime example of show-not-tell storytelling, which in my opinion elevates the movie not only in terms of tension, but character development for both sides. Especially Maka, who up until this point we haven't seen on screen, but has been referenced as a villain whose stressor for genocide was euthanizing her son, McLear. The Mirror of Connor the kid's father. To take his suffering away. They're even paired together geographically where one man is made out of stone and the other is emotionally becoming it. Still, there's a lot that's not really shown in this film, but I think needs to be said in Connor's defense. Like how losing a spouse and becoming a single parent overnight is one of the hardest things anyone can go through. And often it requires placing your children's needs above and sometimes at the cost of your own meaning it's probable that Connor never gave himself a chance to grieve, and as a result, he became like Stone, emotionally apathetic but trying for his children, which would explain why Saoirse seeks out Ben and not their father to learn more about her mom. Not only are they closer in age, but unlike their father, Ben's not hurt by the memory of Rana. He's comforted by it yet possessive. That's mine! You gave it to me, not you! So it makes sense that towards the end of the film, when Saoirse is given a choice between this world and the next, it's not automatic that she would stay with her family. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Back to Maka. We find out that she's self-medicating, which is a boon to Ben since it makes her slow up the stairs. Ben tries to break Maka's jars to free her emotions, but only magic can defeat magic. When Ben presents Saoirse with a conch to do just that, she's too weak to play it. And rather than pressure her, knowing that it could be their last minutes on Earth together, Ben instead tells Saoirse it's not her fault and gives her the one thing she's always wanted, their mom. They're about to die, and he's comforting her with her mother's song. This is beautiful, and perhaps my favorite scene in any film. When Saoirse does play the conch, all of Maka's pent-up emotions are released in a magical maelstrom that doesn't kill the Owl Witch, but saves her. Which is not only a fantastic message, but a feast for the eyes. Just... It. it's it's stunning. It. Just stunning. It. Repentant for all the harm that she's caused, Maka gives Q a moment that all children have secretly yearned for. The ability to ride her pets like valiant steeds. However, when they get back to the lighthouse and discover that Connor has thrown away Saoirse's coat, Ben completes his redemptive arc by confronting his biggest fear, the thing that took his mom. I can do this. Water. For him to take off his life jacket and dive in is a huge testament for just how far he's come. And once he's in the sea, he's accompanied by a cadre of seals who help him find Saoirse's coat. After which, the entire family comes together to save the Dina Shi, culminating in one of the prettiest animated sequences I have ever seen in 2D. And the way it's choreographed to the music bridges it all together, setting the stage for the final scene of Saoirse's choice. Having been raised by an emotionally crippled father and ignored by an angry brother, Saoirse has every reason to go to Tirnana with her mother. But she doesn't. And here's where having a cursory knowledge of Gaelic, or Google, comes in handy because Brenna, the name of their mom, literally translates to sorrow, and Saoirse means freedom. This is huge because even though Tom Moore has gone on record saying he picked the name Brenna because it was his mother's, I'm going to quote Josh Whedon and say all worthy work is open to interpretations the author didn't intend. And boy howdy is this worthy. Back to the metaphor. It is the family's inability to cope with grief that instigates the kid's journey. When Connor throws Saoirse's coat away, he is in essence denying his daughter her mother a spiritual connection to her heritage that Saoirse needs in order to find her voice and place in the family, something that was then exacerbated by Granny who displaced the kids in Dublin and Ben who weaponized their mother's stories to frighten Saoirse away from them. But by taking up the quest to save Saoirse and the history of Ireland in general, the past was exposed, Ben matures, and Connor finds closure. As a result, Granny can stop worrying, which I believe was fueling her busybody behavior. Thus, Saoirse frees her family from the sorrow of her mother's memory, not by obliterating it, but by embracing it. So in conclusion, if you're one of those people looking at this film for accurate depictions of Irish mythology, don't. Allow the story to be and trust that it's better served for it. Because once you do, what you are left with is a damn near flawless movie. One with seamless animation, soulful storytelling, and a wonderful score. The only bad thing I can say about it really is, I wish I had seen it in theaters. Bum 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 b